Hello and welcome to The Spectrum Show. Coming up in this episode, we get all the news and latest games from June 1987. I flick through some fanzines. I review some older games. Take a look at a newer title. Jeff checks out another mod. And I end with a book review. But first, it's the news. DeMarc have won the rights to produce a game based on the next James Bond movie, The Living Daylights. Having previously written A View to a Kill, some members of the press were surprised that they would be given another chance. But DeMarc promise a more action-based game this time. CRL are continuing to produce adventure games based on classic horror stories. The last one, Dracula, was cleverly marketed as being suitable for those aged 15 or older and they are using the same stunt for their latest effort, Frankenstein. Continuing with the horror theme, and CRL have also announced that another horror game, Jack the Ripper, will also soon be available, but this time having an 18 certificate. Saga Systems, the producer of Spectrum Peripherals, has gone into liquidation. Known for their excellent keyboard replacements, and latterly for their thrown together set of peripherals called The Complement, the company blamed their demise on the recent machines produced by Amstrad, as they already have good keyboards, and there is now no longer an incentive to replace them. Adverts for Matthew Smith's brand new game have started to appear in popular magazines, though wackily titled Attack of the Mutant Zombie Flesh-Eating Chickens from Mars, it's sure to be a massive hit, following on from Manic Miner and Jet Set Willy. The star of the game is said to be a new character named Zappo the Dog, and software projects were pushing this game with full-page, full-colour adverts. As we know, the game never actually made it to release, with a game called Star Pause by the same company, named as the rewritten, botched together final result, being released sometime later. And now on to the top selling games. Coming into the chart this month is Sentinel, a strategy game from Firebird, Nemesis the Warlock from Martek. Ghost Hunter from Codemasters, Barbarian from Palace Software, and Doc the Destroyer from Melbourne House. And that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from June 1987. For many popular, and some not so popular hobbies, there have always been fanzines. Created by dedicated individuals, sometimes with the help of a few friends, these paper-based, self-made and self-printed mini-magazines were delivered by post to anyone who paid. The style, content, layout and size were often restricted by the tools and devices available to the people, or available at the time, and many were photocopied from original dot matrix printouts. Folded or just stapled together, these sheets were sent out to the waiting punters, full of the latest news about their specific hobby, often not covered by national magazines, or at least to a level that these people could do. This trend still continues today, with people producing PDF magazines, myself included, although the focus has shifted to blogs, podcasts and YouTube channels. The idea though is the same, produce your own content aimed at a specific audience, and enjoy yourself at the same time. For the early computers, there were many such fanzines and the Spectrum had its fair share. Examples include Crashed, Desert Island, Microdrive Exchange, From Beyond, and many more. Some specific ones focused on particular pieces of hardware, such as the Disciple Disk Interface or the Microdrive. The Disciple fanzine, called Format, started in 1987 and included general news, Disciple news, tutorials, tips on how to get software to work on the system, and technical articles as well. It was well laid out, clearly printed, and changed very little during its long life, covering over 10 years. For Disciple users, this must have been a great resource. The Microdrive one, named Microdrive Exchange, began life in 1984, with four A4 printed sheets. The layout was, to be honest, non-existent, just lines of text, 
The content was mostly tips for converting games to run off cartridge, along with general Mac drive goodness. It ran for just 24 issues, ending in 1986, with the end coming due to the many interfaces and multifaces that offered the user the same functionality that the magazine was covering. Many of the fanzines only ran for a few months, with very few managing 12 or more, and this makes them difficult to obtain based on the numbers produced. Certainly originals are hard to come by. The world of Spectrum Archives though does contain a large quantity of these, ready to read through. Later, notable examples included Classics, a short-lived but well-produced fanzine covering many aspects of the Spectrum. It had reviews, a letters page, special features, and random elements, much like the later years of Yor Sinclair. Crashed was another popular fanzine, running from 1984 to 2000, and this good-looking publication included not only Spectrum material, but Sam Coupe articles as well. There was a playing tips section with pokes and maps, technical information, PD sections, and of course software reviews. The layout improved as the fanzine got older, with the addition of more images and a better overall look. Another notable fanzine is the ZX Files. This well-produced and great-looking publication included the usual things, news, editorials, game reviews, gossip and interviews. They also covered the emulator scene, the PD scene, online forums and many, many more topics. Later issues even came with a cover tape. Some fanzines focused on specific subjects such as adventure games. From Beyond was larger than most other fanzines at the time, often having more than 50 pages per issue. The content included news, a letters section, game reviews and help pages. It was mainly text at first, even the reviews, but they sometimes published game maps. Reading through the fanzines gives you a different angle to what the national magazines were producing, and it's clear that the people who created them are enthusiastic and wanted to provide a service to other Spectrum owners when the retail magazines were disappearing. Inevitably, one by one, they slowly stopped being made as the Spectrum gave way to the 16-bit machines. When the internet arrived, however, a whole new group of people popped up, willing to put their time and effort into producing content for other users, and to continue the tradition first started by the fanzines all those years ago. This is Dominator, released by System 3 in 1989. Far away, an evil bunch of aliens are massing and preparing to take over the entire universe. Blah, 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 it's the same old story again. And guess what? It's one man's job to stand against them. And that just happens to be you. After the intro screen that features a terrible racket that tries to pass itself off as music, the first stage gets underway and we have a vertical shooter. Your large ship waits patiently as the stars scroll past and soon enough the first batch of aliens arrive. It's blasting all the way and your ship seems vastly underpowered to cope with the alien onslaught. And for me this first level was very difficult to get past. The movement patterns of the alien made it tricky to survive and actually get onto the better parts of the game. If you are good enough though, you will soon enter a nicely detailed alien landscape with pulsating organs and grasping limbs, still having to fight off the onslaught of aliens. I'll be honest here and say that I had to use pokes to get this far. I did try to conquer this level, but after about 20 attempts I never reached this point. Onwards then and eventually we meet the first boss. Taking this out and the next level loads. Even on 1 to 8k machines you have to load each level one by one. The game at this point switches to a horizontal shooter and gets even harder. The aliens now fire back and the landscape makes it difficult to negotiate and hard not to crash. You do get a chance to pick up weapons on this level though so you can have things like rear firing, lasers and smart bombs. 
and you certainly need them. Remember, I'm playing here with cheats, and there's no way I could make it this far without them. There are two more levels to play through, both horizontal, and both with equally well-drawn backgrounds. The graphics are great, as you can see, very detailed and animated, but the sound is a bit of a letdown. Even 1 to 8K machines don't deliver the goods, or make use of the sound chip. Control is responsive, which to be honest is a really good job, considering how difficult the game is. A great shooter then, but one for experts, or cheaters only. This is Super G-Man, released by Codemasters in 1987. You play a new recruit at the Space Geology College, and being new, you've gone and missed the shuttle back to base. Now you have to get back across the deadly landscape with just a jetpack and laser to help you. This game is a sort of cross between Lunar Jetman and Scramble. You fly or walk across the scrolling landscape, able to speed up or slow down, and of course thrust and fire. Walking into anything other than a flat surface and you'll explode for some reason, which really does get frustrating. You have a limited amount of fuel too, so you have to keep picking up refills, and the same goes for your ammo. You can shoot the aliens, but it's far easier just to avoid them if possible. There are teleports set out at various stages, which transfer you further along the level, and these can be very helpful in getting you to the end quicker. The graphics are large and chunky, and borrow a lot from Jetpack, but sadly doesn't take the control system with it, which makes it really awkward to get your Jetman, sorry, G-Man, into the right place at the right time. This game has a kind of fake gravity that means you bounce when you hit the ground, and sometimes sends you flying back up into the air directly into an alien. Thrust seems to get more powerful the longer you hold the key, so this again makes control very tricky. Sound is used well, with a nice tune on the title page and a few spot effects here and there. As you progress, you get into caves and missiles that fire upwards, similar to Scramble, and manoeuvring becomes even harder, sometimes to the point that it just makes the game unplayable for me. For a budget release this isn't bad, if you can get to grips with the control system, but I would have been very annoyed if I'd paid full price for this. This is Battle City, released by Epsilon in 2016. Battle City is a conversion of the NES game of the same name, and involves, amongst other things, protecting your base from enemy tanks. Your base is represented by a large bird at the bottom of the screen, and the other tanks drive around firing randomly. Controlling your own tank, you pursue these enemies and blow them up. There are a set number of tanks per level, and until that is reached, they will keep respawning after you've destroyed them. There are bonus items to collect too, including a hat, which gives your tank protection, a watch that stops the enemy tanks, and bombs that destroys all visible tanks. The screen is set out in a maze fashion, 
with some walls that can be destroyed. The enemy tanks can also destroy these walls, so you need to be careful when chasing them down. The graphics are large and mirror the NES versions quite well, and the sound suits the game really nicely. The gameplay has a nice learning curve, and the difficulty rises each level, making this a good experience. This is a nice little game then, it's easy to get into, and it offers a challenge the longer you play. Certainly give this one a try. There are 101 Jet Set Willy mods on the world of Spectrum. I've played them all, and these are some of my favourites. Today we're going to take a look at Willy in the Island of Mystery Part 1 Exploration. This was released in 2007 by Harve Ast, who, according to the world of Spectrum, is a French developer. The first thing that struck me about this game is how beautiful it looks. The title screen looks absolutely fantastic, and the music that plays along is, of course, Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, which is the usual title music for Jet Set Willy. But this is a 128K version of the game, so it's been polished up for the 128K's better sound. And as you play this game, you'll find that that theme of really beautiful graphics continues. There's one screen called Brontosaurus that has a huge Brontosaurus in it. It's very detailed, it takes up nearly the entire screen and is eating the leaves on the trees. It looks really good and is well worth seeking out. But it isn't just things in the foreground that look good. One of the first things I noticed is as you come into the game, the, the jungle, which is the third screen, the trees look really good, they're just really well drawn in trees. Even though they're quite blocky, they still look good. Then on other screens, some of the backgrounds are really detailed. There's a screen called Spirit that kind of has a volcano and various other details in the background. And that just looks absolutely excellent. Again, that is another screen that it is worth playing this game and just seeking out that screen just to see that. Another one that I particularly like, particularly like the background detail in, is one called Fear of the Dark. Well, that is a particularly difficult screen, but it's well worth seeking out just for that background. But even when the backgrounds aren't detailed, I think they look really good. There's a screen called Rainbow that just uses the 8 pixel blocks of the spectrum and different attribute colours on those to create a rainbow. And it looks really good, really vibrant. So if you like good graphics, good 8-bit graphics, good 8-bit spectrum graphics where of course you've got to overcome all the problems of the spectrum's attributes, then this game is well worth playing just to see that. Now when you first start playing this game, you kind of think, oh, this looks like a very linear game. You start, and the first few screens, there's only one way to go. You basically walk from left to right, getting through the first few screens. And those screens become increasingly more difficult. The first couple of screens, you think, this is easy. What's going on here? And then you go, ah, okay, it's getting a bit more tricky. Then, ah, this is a bit difficult. Now, I've said before in this series that I don't like really difficult games. And this at times can feel really difficult, but then there are intermissions where it isn't quite so hard, so it's not relentlessly difficult all the time. But I must admit, this, this is getting on the side of too much difficulty for me. But it's still a good game. And of course, it's a modern game, and when you're building a modern game, it was released in 2007, the author will have known that whoever was playing this game had access to save states. I don't think this is ever going to be a game where I'm going to do a walkthrough where I don't use save states. So after a few screens, you reach a screen called Statues, and this is kind of the central hub of the game. From there you can go to various different screens. This is another game that introduces something new, and those statues have teleports. If you jump into the statue's mouth, you get teleported to different parts of the map. And I really like that. It's, a, it's an innovative way of doing it. Kind of harks back a little bit to Jet Set Willy 2, which of course had a very, very similar thing when you go to Beam Me Down Spotty. You can use the four platforms there to go to different areas of the map, and this has a, a feel of that. The other thing that this game has that a lot of more modern games have, but the original Jet Set Willy didn't have, is screens that modify as you move through them. So in various screens you'll find that when you collect the items, an escape route moves up, or the room changes in some way. 
first room I noticed this in was one called Piranhas. When you collect all of the objects in the room called Piranhas, the small piranhas jumping out of the water at the bottom of the screen change into one big fish that's jumping up and actually can make the screen a little bit more tricky. In other areas and in other screens, you collect items to open up exits or you go to certain parts of the screens and it will modify and an exit will open, sometimes at the bottom of the screen, sometimes to the left or the right of the screen. One thing that wasn't in this game, that was in the previous game, Terry the Turtle and this game, is the collapsing floor from Manic Miner. So that makes another reappearance, and if anyone listened to the Terry the Turtle review I did in the last episode, you'll know that I'm really a big fan of collapsing floor. I was glad to see it back in that game, I'm glad to see it back in this game. It always felt conspicuous by its absence in Jet Set Willy. So that's Willy in the Island of Mystery Port 1 Exploration. There isn't a part 2 that I've been able to find. Certainly there isn't a part 2 on the World of Spectrum website. If anyone knows of part 2, please let me know in the comments. I'd love to play that. Although, I still feel like I've got a bit to master in this game. I have played it a lot, but it still feels like there's more to find. That's another good thing about this game. It does feel like there's a lot to find, but nothing's particularly hidden. It's not overly difficult to find new areas, but you sometimes stumble across them and think, oh wow, I didn't know that was there. That looks great. So until next time, happy gaming. This is 3D Space Wars, released by Houston Consultants in 1983. This is the first of a quadrology by Houston, centering around the evil alien race, the Psydabs. For those not familiar with this race, it's actually baddies written backwards, but I'm sure you all knew that anyway. The other games in the series are 3D Psydab Attack, 3D Lunar Attack and Astroclone. On to this game then, and the scenario is familiar. You fly around different regions of space, destroying any enemies, watching your fuel, and eventually rid the universe of these evil overlords. When you first launch you are faced with a mass of enemy fighters, and the instinct straight away is to go in guns blazing, but this is a big mistake, and you won't last very long. The best strategy is to quickly head off into open space. The side up fighters do not shoot if you can't see them, in other words if there's nothing on your screen you won't get shot at, and you can use the radar at the bottom of the screen to pick them off one by one, or in small groups. You have to keep an eye on your fuel too, but there are refueling points, but these can only be used once. Using these tactics, you should be able to survive to the next level, where things get harder. The side abs fire more often, and they are harder to hit due to the shape of their ships. The graphics are well drawn, and the 3D works well, with the side abs ships getting larger as they approach. Sound is very well done with an array of effects that sound really nice. For a 16K game, and yes this is a 16K game, this really is well presented and gameplay is really good. Just remember, don't go in for a firefight, get some clear space and choose your targets carefully. Overall then, a great game, especially for 16K. For this section I'm going to review a book, the Sinclair ZX Spectrum A Visual Compendium, released by Bitmap Books in 2015. This is a hefty book that's nearly an inch thick and has a wide variety of contributors including some well-known names. 
the book is a mixture of personal comment, features and game reviews. Covering some of the most iconic games, the glossy pages really help to show off the graphics and the text is informative and well written. Industry figures are interviewed and give their account of their times in the Spectrum world. The special features covers things like graphics, sound and artwork, with several people contributing with their thoughts and experiences on the subject. The artwork in the book is top notch, not only with some great photography and layout, but some fantastic pixel art. A really interesting read and a good coffee table book, something that you could quite happily pick up, read a few pages and put down again. It really emphasises the importance and brilliance of the Sinclair machines, all in one excellent package. Highly recommended then, 